Thank you. So welcome everyone uh, to this meeting of COVID societies titled What is the place of uh, social sciences and the humanities in pandemic times? My name is Sabina Leonelli. I'm the co-director of the Exeter Center of the Study of the Life Sciences. And we've been uh, co-organizing this meeting together with the Welcome Center for uh, Cultures and Environments of Health. And um, what I'm gonna be doing now is just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. And then I'm gonna uh, give the word to my colleague, uh, Des Fitzgerald, who's gonna actually chair the meeting. So just to remind you, first of all, this meeting is being recorded so that it can then be available uh, on the university website. So uh, keep that in mind, please, uh, when you're intervening in the meeting. And if you're not happy with this happening, then um, unfortunately, there's not much we can do. And uh, just keep it in mind when you're intersecting and when you're um, asking questions. Uh, so the speakers will be uh, giving short talks that will introduce you to the format very shortly. Uh, when it's time for uh, the Q&A uh, discussion format, you have two choices to intervene. Uh, you can raise your hand with the raise a hand tool of Zoom that you find in the little participant window at the bottom. Or you can formulate your questions in the Q&A space uh, within the Zoom tool. Now, if you decide to do that, uh, I will be, while uh, chair, um, Des is chairing the meeting you know, in person, I will be having a look at that and uh, monitoring the questions that come in. But please don't use uh, the chat tool as a general discussion tool, just because it can be very distracting to people who are trying to follow on, on, on what is going on in, in the panel debate. And I think uh, all of this said, I'm very happy to give the word to Des and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Sabina, and thanks everyone for being here. It's great to see a good crowd turnout for this. Um, so my name is Des Fitzgerald. I'm an Associate Professor of Sociology here at Exeter, where I'm primarily based at the Welcome Centre for Cultures and Environments of Health. Um, it's my great pleasure to chair this session. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I want to give a few very brief kind of orienting remarks to give a sense of why we think we're here and why we think this is a conversation worth having and where we, we want you to intervene. So this is a roundtable session that's it's the outcome of a series of conversations that many of us have been having within social science and humanities departments here at Exeter and of course I'm sure many of us have been having those conversations too about how our research practices might orient themselves to the COVID-19 pandemic. That effort has been widespread but it's been coordinated by people in our two centres that's EGENIS, the Centre for the Study of the Life Sciences and the Welcome Centre. And I guess it's no coincidence, perhaps, that this reflection on social sciences and humanities um, in a time of biological crisis has felt especially pressing to people in science and technology studies, as well as in the medical humanities, who, of course, have long been attentive to how um, scientific and clinical practices are inseparable from social and cultural life. So our conversation has traveled in two directions, which are hoping to foreground simultaneously in today's conversation. The first is that that thing that's occurred to us is that as the pandemic has developed and as universities coordinated their efforts around it, it struck us that there's a very real risk of the pandemic being only understood as a crisis at the level of biology or as exclusively an epidemiological or a clinical problem. And that there was therefore a very real risk that universities and funders might miss out on the enormously relevant and actually very boringly practical expertise that scholars in the humanities and social sciences might actually bring to bear on some of the key questions of the pandemic, which of course is increasingly visible as an economic, social and cultural crisis too. And then running parallel to that pragmatic issue is also maybe more of an existential concern, which is not simply the question of what our disciplines and methods have to contribute to this crisis in the immediate sense, but the question of what is the place for them now more generally, um, what's the place for the study of literature, of philosophy, of anthropology, of politics, when the research base of the country itself, as well as the ed educational institutions that hold that base together, are perhaps being now transformed by a seemingly endless horizon of disease, of sickness and infection, of overrun health systems, experimental therapeutics, and so on. So is there any chance that this horizon is going to render certain kinds of thinking and maybe even certain kinds of scholarly practices um, simply untenable? So we've assembled seven speakers to think across some or all of these issues through their own work and their, their recent interventions in, in the crisis. And I guess what we're really hoping here for is discussion. So everyone is going to uh, speak for no more than five minutes. I will, I promise them I'll take pleasure in muting them if they go over their five minutes. Um, and that should give us a good 45 minutes for, for general discussion. As we've insisted on the roundtable format to kind of, um, as a, a collective discussion, not just a kind of a Q&A. So please do um, uh, uh, feel free to chip into that um, as we go along. Okay, without further ado, then let's turn to our first speaker. Um, today's first speaker is, is Angela Cassidy. Angela, I'm delighted to say, is now Senior Lecturer in Science and Technology Studies here at Exeter. 
And um, her recent work has centered on science policy as it attends to the regulation and government, especially of animals and animal practices. Her new book is Vermin's Victims and Disease, British Debates over Bovine Tuberculosis and Badgers. That is available open access. You get a free PDF by Googling it if you, if you want to do that while Angela's talking. Um, but over to you, Angela. Thank you, Des. Thanks for the plug. Um, okay, so uh, let me just fight with the screen sharing briefly. Um, okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, fantastic. So I shall not talk for long. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking around broadly the theme of, of human animal relationships um, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and more specifically around uh, a project, um, a um, <clears throat> collaborative project, uh, focusing specifically on animal feeding. So I wanted to start with this image, which I think is, uh, is from one of the UN's uh, open access uh, art collections that they put on Unsplash, um, which were released quite early in the sort of lockdown period as, as public information. Um, but from what we're able to tell from within the project is partly while it's, it's a uh, very kind of idealized image of, of what it might be like to stay safe and stay home. Um, the question of, of to what extent that does reflect um, people's lives and particularly within this image, the prominence of, of vegetation and birds uh, is just what I wanted to flag. Okay, so hopefully I can... There we go. So um, very briefly, um, some brief, broader comments. Um, one of the first things I wanted to say, uh, partly in relation to the platform here, is something I've noticed quite recently is as we shift from an emergency mode into thinking about the pandemic as something that hasn't gone away and isn't going away, um, an increased uh, appearance of, of kind of the a living with uh, talk. Um, but within that, um, much of that, or some of that living with discussion is, it seems to be very much in terms of, eh, live with it. Um, so kind of fueling kind of a laissez-faire framing the idea that, that basically the virus is there, we can't do anything about it, we just put up with it. Um, but of course, living with um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is just like learning to live with any other pathogen. As we get to know it, we then develop practices for living with it in a way that's more safely for people. It's, this is a process that we've studied many, many times across STS and medical humanities. And so there's loads of knowledge there to draw on. Um, okay, moving on a bit more specifically. So the project I'm gonna talk about is called From Feed the Birds to Do Not Feed the Animals. Um, it's a welcome collaborative grant with uh, Exeter Archaeology, um, <clears throat> Reading, Roehampton National Museums of Scotland. Um, briefly, I just wanted to say we heard that this was being funded and then lockdown started to kick in a matter of weeks afterwards. We didn't even get a chance to get together to celebrate the grant. Um, and so obviously, like much of our research, it was paused for a while. Uh, and we had to do some really serious rethinking of what we were going to do because it was very much predicated on the idea that we needed to spend a lot of time in person socialising uh, in order to foster the, the collaboration across disciplines and also with our um, external partners and working a lot with objects. Um, and it's made me think a lot about kind of this process of also how we rethink how we do our research while rethinking and understanding how the world's changing around us. So we have kind of an emergency pivot mode to using technologies like Zoom and Teams. And again, we can see a standardization. I don't know why that just moved. Um, but looking ahead, we also think, need to think about doing research at physical distance and that there's lots of old fashioned technologies that we can actually use to do that, that can help us reach maybe people that we might not have been able to reach with our research uh, using more um, standard methodologies. Okay, more specifically, animal feeding. Um, so <laughs> this process of animal feeding, um, so like everything else across society, 
what we're seeing is a really profound disruption in animal-human relationships. Um, and one of the big questions, of course, going forwards is to what extent that disruption is temporary and to what extent it will continue to change things. So firstly, uh, in terms of our relationships with our pets um, and our relationship with garden birds. Um, so it's certainly true that, that um, interest and, and companionship, interest in, in taking on pets, interest in um, relating to the, the um, wildlife immediately near us has, has become a major occupation and seems to be again something we want to look at is uh, solace for people but the question of, of whether they are safe and um, I have actually seen dogs with masks on so people are also concerned about their pets the question of the zoonotic origins of, uh, of COVID itself um, that zoonosis itself is op generally thought about as, as coming from animals to humans but we do know that COVID is going back to animals to cats uh, and also to mink and, and many mink on in mink farms in the Netherlands are being slaughtered because of it um, and that that process of zoonotic transmission is often seen as profoundly unnatural but we do know um, that viruses are constantly moving between animals and humans so the question is more what has exacerbated that process to lead us to the situation we're in. Then in terms of the disruption between humans and animals, um, the memes we saw about wildlife returning because people were suddenly gone from the world and, and what that kind of says about some people's concerns about uh, the relationship between humans and nature. Um, and thirdly, what we're also seeing is, is in practical terms, um, because people are not in cities, are not out and about, are not buying lunch, um, are, are not there to be coexisting with animals in cities, there's been a profound disruption in not just humans and animals related to each other, but the, the sudden absence of food. And so we're seeing recurring stories um, about animals firstly appearing where we didn't see them in lockdown and then misbehaving. Um, and often these stories are very often put in criminal terms. Um, the story about the ravens in the Tower of London. Angela, uh, 30 seconds if you could. Am I nearly 30, done? You're, you're sure. well over 30 seconds if you could. Sorry, okay. <laughs> anyway, ravens. Uh, finally, of course, um, in terms of our project partners, in thinking about zoos and third sector and heritage uh, and NGOs, uh, they're all being very profoundly affected in terms of their normal income streams are gone. So they are all in crisis and this in turn is effect affecting conservation. So we can kind of go all the way around in a circle on all these different aspects of uh, social change and think about through the lens, lens of animal feeding and I'll stop. Thanks, Angela. That was great. Um, my Sorry, five minutes is actually, long. no, you're fine. Five minutes is a cruel amount of time, I realise. It's just enough to work yourself into a point and, <laughs> and then you have to stop. Sorry. Um, I just want to move on to our next speaker, Ollie Claver. Um, Ollie is a research, research associate at the Wellcome Centre for Cultures and Environments of Health. He's currently working across two projects, um, one on how cancer affects couples and how therapy intervenes in that space. Um, and the second, which I think we're going to hear about now, is about loneliness and isolation in the times of pandemic. So, Ollie, whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you very much. I'm hoping that you can, can you see that? Screen share working? No, how about now? All good, cool. Yeah, so thank you very much, Des. I'm here to talk about the Lockdown Blues and I am one third of the project. So I'm doing it with uh, Charlotte Jones and Fred Cooper. Um, a bit of context and situation is, it's part of the Welcome Centre um, and that's really important actually because there's a, um, a, a focus on loners within the southwest um, this network going on. Another big part is that it's situated in Exeter which um, is important in the sense that it was issued UNESCO status last year for um, literature um, so linking well-being and reading together um, and specifically for this project we've got some really cool partners with Exeter Phoenix and that's a um, it's a local art centre and it focuses on harnessing creativity with uh, culture and health. 
part of X to Phoenix is um, a guy called Darren, and he's an artist, and some of that is based within the project. For example, the really cool logo you got here with spinning heads, that's Darren. Um, and finally, Devon Libraries, um, again, focusing on how um, literature and reading can improve people's well-being. So the Lockdown Blues, that's why I'm here to talk to you. And here's the, the home page. Um, the focus of this project is less about research and more about the social aspect of um, humanities and social sciences. Um, I'm going to shock you all, but there was a time before COVID. And in that time before COVID, um, there was this thing called loneliness. And that is something that has carried on, is ongoing. Um, and particularly over um, lockdown is, is where we kind of focus the project. Um, it was weird over lockdown in that people were kind of on one of two sides of the fence. And for lots of people, lockdown meant a sense of introspection and returning to old hobbies that people have forgotten about or finding new hobbies like gardening and realizing that courgettes are absolutely mental and we just keep on pounding them out all the time. But for a lot of people, uh, lockdown and socialization it was horrible and isolation and loneliness was a big thing. Um, and I think lots of people experienced that anecdotally, but for a large cohort of these people that experienced it are people that are um, perhaps in different situations in the sense that they may be already socially isolated because of disabilities or um, illness. And actually lockdown meant that there was an extra element to that and shielding meant that people had to further be locked down and isolated from people. Um, and for these people, it meant that often they were told they told they need to shield and there was no guidance and all kind of based on the socio-political environment, meaning that loneliness was exasperated. Um, so that's where our project comes from, really, focusing on uh, loneliness experiences before, during and after um, lockdown. And what we want to create is this online scrapbook, is, is what we've been calling it, and people submit their experiences of, of loneliness throughout this period. Um, it's multifaceted because people's experiences of loneliness is multifaceted. So people submit their, um, whether it's artwork or poems or stories or songs to the scrapbook and it's a collective repository of people's experiences. Um, and our hope is really that it's a way for people to feel connected with other people and it's a way for their voice to be heard and it's a way for them to realise that they're not alone and um, yeah. That's what our project's about. Um, how much do you have time, Des? You've got a minute left, but if you're- Oh, cool, in which case, I'll carry on. <laughs> so, like I said, there's lots of different uh, mediums that people could submit. Um, and while we are focusing more on the project side of, of um, the, uh, the lockdown blues, rather than research per se, um, actually, it's about making a social connection and keeping people together and keeping people connected. Um, what we try to do is encapsulate a way for more people to get involved. So we've got an easy read version on the website. And um, there's lots of ways for people to submit stuff. So you can do it online, you can email, you can send stuff via Twitter. Um, you can even post stuff to us and we can upload that onto the website. We're still accepting submissions and we're encouraging more submissions, especially as we move into potentially another phase of lockdown. And um, that's the Lockdown Blues, lockdownblues.co.uk. Fantastic. Thank you, Holly. That was great. Um, just, uh, so our next speaker is Luna Dalazan, and as Luna is setting up her screen, let me just ask the speakers to make sure they open the chat to it, otherwise you won't see me yelling at you about time, and that would be a great disappointment, I'm sure. So our third speaker is Luna Dalazan. Luna is an Associate Professor of Philosophy and Medical Humanities here at Exeter. Thanks to the Wellcome Trust, she's currently spending a lot of time thinking about the role of shame in the context of health, medicine, and clinical practices. Luna. Great. Thanks, Des. Thanks for the introduction. So as Des mentioned, I'm thinking a lot about shame. I'm the PI on a welcome funded research project called Shame in Medicine. And as part of this project, we've been exploring how shame and stigma have featured in COVID-19 and particularly in relation to public health interventions. So understanding the concrete harms caused by the negative phenomena associated with shame and social stigma is paramount in order to understand the overall harms caused not only by the, the virus, but also by the public health interventions that are put in place to mitigate its negative effects. Both shame and stigma negatively impact on health seeking behaviors, cause personal and social harm and exacerbate existing social and health inequalities. And as you have probably noticed, shame and stigma have been prominent features of the pandemic. The media has been saturated with news stories highlighting shame and stigma, 
And as we have seen, shaming has become a powerful social and political force during COVID-19, in part driven by the widespread use of social media. So in the UK, in the first months of COVID-19 crisis, have demonstrated that instances of shame, shaming, stigma, and discrimination are often directly related to um, or directly arising from public health interventions. So for example, consider the lepers of Leicester resulting from the UK's first local lockdown or the ongoing shaming of individuals for the use or non-use of face masks. In addition, there have been ample cases of doctor shaming, um, for example, for being disease spreaders or refusing to work without adequate PPE. Um, in care context, providers have spoken about the shame associated with losing patients, unknowingly spreading the virus and being unwilling to work or to return to work to fight on the front line after having left the profession. Shame has been a common affective experience for individuals struggling with various COVID-19 related hardships, including of course illness, but also especially related to socially, social distancing measures such as lockdowns and stay at home orders. For example, due to factors as diverse as poverty, job loss, illness, isolation, family breakdown, food poverty and domestic abuse. And of course, there is the ubiquitous pandemic shaming, which is in part driven by social media. We have seen the widespread phenomena of identifying people who ignore public health warnings as COVID idiots, or the use of the hashtag selfish pricks, um, the use of shaming by police as a tactic to encourage compliance with COVID restrictions, and countless stories of individuals and groups being shamed for various transgressions, including things as harmless as not joining in with neighbors for Thursday night uh, NHS clapping. Shame dynamics are also circulating in political contexts where the charge of attempting to save face um, during COVID-19 is frequently leveled at politicians and governments. And the persistent use of the term China virus has been a political strategy to develop, to deflect blame and responsibility. In fact, the stigma generated by racially loaded terminology has been directly related to racism and abuse experienced by ethnic minorities and foreigners in Britain. In fact, when considering shame, shaming, stigma and discrimination, there is particular concern when we consider the uneven distribution of social power, resources and health for BAME communities in the UK who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and how these inequalities are in turn in intimately related to experiences of stigma and shame. So as we enter this new phase of living with the virus, as Angela highlighted, um, emerging public um, health interventions need to be continuously assessed for their potential to produce shame, shaming, stigma and discrimination. For example, interventions such as local lockdowns, international and national quarantines, the use or non-use of face masks and other PPE, the proposed introduction of so-called immunity passports or the use of antibody tests needs to be carefully managed in order to avoid the stigma and shame that easily arises when populations are divided or stratified, especially in climates of fear and uncertainty. So as part of our shame and medicine project, we've been considering the role of shame and stigma um, in the current global health crisis. Um, so there's a few preliminary publications there and we are currently seeking for funding um, for a project called Scenes of Shame and Stigma, which will take an interdisciplinary humanities approach through history, philosophy and cultural studies, working with the literary scholar Arthur Rose and the historian Fred Cooper to analyze new stories from the, 12th, the first 12 months of COVID-19 in order to investigate how shame and stigma are firstly related to public health interventions and secondly, have been shaped by or exacerbated by the use of social media and rapid global information exchange. Um, this research fundamentally requires a humanities approach focusing on the affective, cultural and social, social political um, dynamics circulating within social life, domestic spaces, medical culture and political discourse. If you're interested in finding out more, I'd love to hear from you. Um, please visit our project website. Um, thank you. Five minutes. <laughs> Four minutes, 49 seconds. Thanks, Luna. <laughs> um, so our next speaker is Angelique Richardson, and I should say because of an administrative error by me, Angelique didn't have the chance to make practice screen sharing. So if there's any problems, it's my fault, not Angelique's, I should say. But anyway, in, this, in the assumption that will go smoothly, I'm delighted that Angelique Richardson is with us. She's professor at the Department of English here at Exeter. She works across the history and science, or history of science and literature here, with special expertise in writings on eugenics. Her new book, which I think is not quite out yet, but correct me if I'm wrong, Angelique, is The Politics of Thomas Hardy, Biology, Culture and Environment, coming with Oxford University Press this year, I think. No, not this year, but thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got another one coming out before that on um, 
rewriting the citizenship handbook uh, with with um, my colleague Malcolm Richards from the School of Education. Fantastic. Well, five minutes over to you, Angelique. Thanks very much, Des. Thank you to you and to Sabina for inviting me along to this. Great to see so many people here, including members of our COVID reading group. Right, I am going to uh, attempt to share my screen now. Um, have a look. Should be green button right at the bottom. There we go. So, as um, a historian of science in a department of English, what I'm going to be talking about today is the role that history, and in particular history of eugenics, can play. What it can tell us about, in this context, the UK government's approach to COVID. So, while early British eugenics, which we can date to the 1860s, was most immediately focused on class, the racism that underpinned it needs to be brought back to the centre. The relation between eugenics and racism, both scientific and non-scientific, is a direct one. The founder of eugenics, Galton, was also an advocate of white supremacy, imperialism and slavery. You'll see from this slide, let me just take you back. Um, from, from this slide, some of Galton's mid-century pronouncements on race. By contrast, Darwin was an abolitionist who would make clear his increasing opposition to eugenics. You'll see here, Galton refers to the Hindu as inferior to the Chinese in strength, business habits, etc., and to the Arab as little more than an eater up of other men's produce. As we understand the past, we understand the present. In turn, our understanding of the present renews and expands our comprehension of the past. Historians trace the effects of ideological, racist, and fascist causes and systems of exclusion, oppression, and violence. These are not discontinuous moments. History provides us with a route to responsibility. I'm defining eugenics as a theory and practice based on the notion that there are people who are biologically inferior and expendable. Ultimately, it is the practice of decreeing that some should live or thrive and some should not. Eugenics has been driven by dominant national concerns from differential fertility along class lines, i.e. how to ensure the British imperial race was replenished from the middle class, which most advocates of eugenics in Britain belonged, to how to avoid miscegenation in the colonies and at home from immigration. Although the term race, which biologists, starting with Darwin, have come to show us has no scientific basis or credence, could be used by eugenists in the sense of racial strains, varieties within indigenous groups. It was increasingly concerned with race as we now understand it. The separating out of humans on the basis of skin color. While not all racists were eugenists, the eugenists I have encountered also appear to have been racists. Actually, I want to show you this one. This is uh, Bradley. Um, eugenics has returned to public attention as Tory politicians from Raab and Bradley to Special Advisor Cummings and Toby Young and Sabisky fleetingly in government posts have used eugenic ideas to serve their political ends. It would be difficult to deny the eugenic elements of England's approach the pandemic. I say England because its death rates have diverged significantly from the rest of the UK since responsibility for controlling the virus was handed back to individuals on the 10th of May. As you'll know, there's been, and as Luna pointed out for us, a disproportionately high number of deaths from COVID-19 among black and ethnic minorities and the working class of all ethnicities working as key workers with underlying conditions, a eugenic addendum. This highlights the effects of ongoing and entrenched inequalities, poor housing, low paid jobs and racism. 
these have physiological as well as social consequences. The groups that have suffered most alongside older people are the racialized other, the working class and the disabled. These three groups are the historic targets of eugenics. Everyone here will know about herd immunity, Cummings and Johnson, so I don't need to say more there. We'll also be familiar with the increasingly hostile environment that we inhabit in the UK. I want to include, conclude with some moments from the 20th century, and I'll leave you to connect them. Churchill wanted Conservatives to fight the 1955 general election with the slogan, Keep England White. This was two years after my father had arrived at Tilbury Dock to find the Britain that he'd left Sri Lanka for to help rebuild Britain festooned with no coloureds, no Irish, no dogs. And the official guide to citizenship, which I mentioned um, earlier, this one here, produced in the year of the hostile environment, 2013, is nationalistic and insular. It leaves out British, Black, Asian and migrant contribution to the UK. So in conclusion, history, in particular history of eugenics, shows an increasing shift towards the racism which is playing out in the present moment. Without understanding these continuities with the past, can we really understand the extent to which the idea that some sections of the population and individuals are more valuable while others can be discounted is in operation? Thank you. Thank you, Angelique. Loads to come back to in discussion there, I think. Um, our next speaker is Ginny Russell. Ginny is a senior research fellow at Agenis and in the Department of Sociology, Philosophy and Anthropology. Her work is broadly around questions of child and adolescent mental health. And her new book is also coming out next year, I hope I'm right this time, um, with Rob Lynch. It's called The Rise of Autism, Risk and Resistance in the Age of Diagnosis. Uh, Ginny, over to you. Thanks, Des. Um, I'll just try and share my screen as well. You got that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, around excess deaths. Um, I got really interested in excess deaths recently. And um, I think this illustrates the point that COVID is really like the ultimate case of intertwining of biological and social. Um, and I've been developing this idea. So this is very much in development. So any feedback is welcome. Um, so if you look at this graph, and in fact, this is the only slide I'm going to show. Uh, you can see a red wave and a blue wave. And this is the three months from April to June 2020. And the UK had actually the highest number of excess deaths of any country in Europe. Uh, so the blue wave is the non-COVID excess deaths and the red wave is deaths that were attributed to COVID. Um, so excess deaths, if you don't know what they are, they're basically defined as more deaths than predicted for the time of year. And the Office for National Statistics have produced a baseline of the average number of deaths over the last five years pre-COVID. And that's illustrated on this graph as zero on the x-axis. So this graph is actually showing the weekly excess deaths at, at more than you would expect for the time of year, rather than just the number of deaths per se. Um, and just out of interest, on an average week in the winter, um, in the last five years, about 1,000 800 people die every day in the UK. So that's a pre-COVID number. So at the absolute peak of the pandemic in um, wave one in April, you can see the number of deaths per day was approximately double what we'd normally expect. Um, and of those deaths at the peak of the pandemic, around 30% or around 30,000 in total between March and May, according to the Office of National F um, Statistics, were not due to COVID. So we had 13,000 excess deaths that were not due to COVID in addition to those 46,000 that we all know about that were um, attributed to COVID at any rate. Um, and of course, as saving lives was the justification for the initial total national lockdown. So it's really important to think about this because if lives were lost as a result of lockdown, 
as opposed to a, a result of COVID in this blue wave of excess deaths, then we need to understand why that is in order to avoid it in future scenarios. And the reasons, the possible reasons are very much interlinked between biology and social aspects. Um, so yeah, um, why were all these people dying from other causes? Um, there are various explanations as to why there are so many non-COVID excess deaths. Um, and I've listed them here underneath the graph. First, COVID-19 might have been present, but not diagnosed. Second, and this has come up in the other talks, that social isolation because of lockdown, which is we can broadly conceive as contributing to an increase in psychological stress, made bodies more vulnerable to diseases, and this could be causing more deaths. So Age UK have released a, um, a report called Dying from Sadness. Um, the third reason, a reluctance to seek care during lockdown could have caused deaths when somebody already had a serious health condition, like not going to hospital. We already know there was a reduced presentation at hospitals for cancer, for example, and lots of other conditions. And reduced service capacity could mean some people with other underlying conditions had not received um, sufficient care, like mental health issues. Although actually there were fewer suicides during this period, which is kind of counterintuitive um, and is interesting. And then also it could be a reporting issue issue in that there was actually an increase in efficiency of regist death registrations just because of this huge interest in in deaths and um, death counts around this time. Um, so who were these blue wave people and why were they dying? And I think this is a question for both quantitative and qualitatively minded social scientists. And actually when we look more closely the group of people in the non-COVID excess deaths in that blue wave had quite a different profile from the people in the COVID wave. So first, unlike the COVID deaths, which were predominantly hospitalised males, blue wave deaths were mostly women and they mostly died in care homes or in their own homes. Um, and the most likely cited cause of deaths was dementia. So similarly to COVID um, deaths, they were often very frail elderly, but unlike COVID, they were usually at home and women. And so my idea was to mount a qualitative research study interviewing grieving relatives or people who have lost uh, people to non-COVID for non-COVID reasons who died in this blue wave to find out why they had died and really uncover the stories behind these non-COVID excess deaths um, to find out, you know, what the point of view was. Um, I mean, obviously this would be quite ethically challenging, but I have got some good ethical advice um, on board. So just an idea that I'm developing. Um, and it just got me thinking also, if I've got time, that on death certificates, causes of death are classified as very discrete disease categories like heart disease, stroke, road traffic accidents and respiratory infections being in the top 10. Is that five seconds? Yeah, OK. Um, so just, just um, got me thinking about how we categorise disease as well. Um, and if you think about um, how epidemiology is done and how diseases are are categorized it seems like maybe we need more of a systems-wide thinking around what actually kills people because it's probably an interaction of all of those things that are listed there social and biological systems so that's it perfect thank you Ginny I'm pretty certain we will return to this in the discussion um, our second from, from from the end speaker is Catherine Tyler Catherine is associate professor of anthropology working broadly within critical race studies with particular attention to white racial identities in Britain. She's currently working on these questions in a project funded by the Economic and Social Research Council on identity and the media in post-Brexit Britain. So Catherine, over to you. And you may be muted, we can't hear you. Sorry, sorry about that. I wanted to say um, thank you very much to um, you, Des, and Sabina for inviting me. And uh, um, I've just got this one slide which sets out the project um, that um, I'm now working on. I mean, I'm going to talk to you a bit about how the research on COVID that I'm now working on, what it's about and how it relates to the work on Brexit that Des has just um, mentioned. So Des asked us to reflect on the role of HAS disciplines in our understanding of the pandemic and to tell you a bit about each of you know, us as speakers, our work on COVID. So I thought the best way for me to address this is to tell you about the project I'm working on, how it came about, who we are, what we're trying to achieve, and then reflect on this disciplinary question. So we're a team of ethnographers 
me, an anthropologist based in Spa, Joshua Blumer, who I saw, and I'm very lovely, he appeared, he's on the call, a human geographer who's working with me, also based in Spa, and Catherine Degnan, a social anthropologist based at Newcastle University. And we as ethnographers are working with um, a team of political scientists, Dan Stevens, Susan Banducci and Laszlo Horvath, all at Exeter, you probably know some of them, and they have skills in to conduct quantitative surveys and to code and map the media. And we're also working with Helen Snell, a Devon-based artist who will help us develop the impact of our research. So we're a team with diverse skills, ethnographers concerned with exploring and engaging with the details and rhythms of everyday life, political scientists concerned with collecting and analysing large-scale public opinion and media data, and an artist concerned with representing, capturing and reimagining the world. So in our COVID research, we bring these diverse skills together to explore the way the media interacts with everyday experiences of COVID-19. And we want to integrate media analysis with quantitative survey and ethnographic research to trace how people across class, race, ethnic, national, generational and geographical identities experience this pandemic. Our focus is upon the inequalities that emerge as a consequence of the pandemic across identities and across geographical locations. Significantly, our research questions and our this mixed methods approach builds on an ongoing project that we're all involved in on identity, belonging and the role of the media in Brexit Britain. And both these projects are funded by the ESRC. So our Brexit project began in September 2018 when Brexit was the big news story. And we set out to examine people's experiences of Brexit across identities and across places in England. By the time of the national lockdown in March, we'd completed 15 months of ethnographic fieldwork in the southwest, in Exeter and Devon, so really interested in Ollie's work, in Leicester, so of course the idea of shaming and uh, uh, that Luna was talking about, uh, uh, and ideas of um, uh, um, um, ethnic diversity and multiculturalism filtered through both the whiteness of the, the, the southwest and the diversity in the East Midlands and also we've been doing research in the northeast of England. So we've conducted now 180 interviews, conversational style interviews, masses of field work, um, we've developed impact sort of networks with local councillors, community workers and so on on Brexit. So then, at the time of the lockdown, it seemed like a natural progression to extend our study of Brexit to include COVID-19, to return to our field sites where we just finished this field work, it's all hot as it were, to ask people about their experiences of COVID. And why was this feel, why did this feel like a natural progression? Well, they're both major social and political processes that are shaping every aspect of British society. Both events are formed by news media and by political discourse. And there, was an, there is an organic synergy between the types of question, questions that we were posing vis-a-vis -vis Brexit, and they're absolutely relevant to the pandemic. Questions concerning people's senses belonging to their local place, the nation, including their experiences of racism, anti-immigrant racism, classism and ageism. Their views on politics and as well as their views, their experiences of the media. And so it is, we're now getting ready, Josh and me here in Exeter, um, um, are getting ready to return to our field sites. Me in Exeter and Devon, and that connects to um, what, um, um, oh God, uh, uh, our first speaker was talking about, you know, the difficulties of doing field work in this pandemic. So we're now getting ready to return to our field sites to develop our re original research on Brexit to explore the ways in which our interviewees are experiencing the pandemic. We hope to explore how COVID-19 has deepened the entrenched inequalities and social polarisation that is emerging as a result of Brexit and producing new ones. And the types of questions that we're going to ask in our fieldwork are informed by the preliminary findings of the first wave of panel survey data connect, conducted in July by my colleagues in politics. So if I've got time, have I got time? Oh, no time. I haven't got the, your chat. Should I stop? I'll stop.
Okay, great. Maybe Julia, we'll, we'll come back to it. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Awesome. Um, perfect, thank you. I, mean, I think we, we got, we'll, we'll come back to some of this, I'm sure. Um, our final speaker, our seventh speaker, by no means least, um, waiting very patiently, is Professor Michael Winter. Uh, so Michael Winter is Professor of Land Economy and Society, as well as Director of the Centre for Rural Policy Research here at Exeter. He works on a wide array of topics across agricultural policy and sociology. And his current work is um, about the governance of food systems and food security, and I think that's what we're going to hear about now. But over to you, Michael. Are we there? Have you got, can you see that screen? Yeah. Gotcha. And you, can, and you can hear me all as well. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, this is, this is uh, talk is about uh, an ESRC project uh, on the impacts of COVID on the food system. So I was one of those uh, people, foolish or wise, I'm not quite sure, who reacted to that call back in, uh, in April for urgent projects. I, I made myself ill actually trying to do the blooming thing because it was a real, a, you know, you had to get them in very, very fast. Uh, we were successful. We now regret we only went for 12 months because we're now almost halfway through, but there we go. What we've been looking at is, is, is this whole issue of the, of the continuity, but particularly the dislocation in the supply chain. And we're looking across five different food, se uh, food sectors, looking at changes in, in route to market and barriers to change, but particularly around this rapid reduction of the hospitality sector. I mean, basically, in, in the space of a few days, about 30 or 40 percent of of what we eat changed in the sense that we weren't eating in uh, in, in pubs and restaurants and buying Costa coffees etc but we're, we're, it was all at home that had a massive implication for for the food sector and there were some very significant challenges um, and we want to also look in this as well as looking at what happened in the short term uh, the long-term implications is you know what's going to happen to the food system further down the road and of course when we wrote this in April we we kind of were laboring under the illusion that you know we might be getting back to normal in the autumn and we'd find a time when we were looking at the new normal but we now know that that is certainly not the case um, and what we've realized in the few months we've been doing this is is whilst uh, academic work generally about food systems has been primarily around producers farmers fishers a lot about retailers and a lot about consumers. We still don't know everything about any of those three categories, but we know a lot more than the black box in the middle uh, of food manufacture, processing, packaging, and distribution. These, these are sort of areas that people, you know, that the firms that operate in that space are not household names like Tesco's. Um, they are uh, sort of behind the obvious immediate sort of look and yet they're hugely hugely important and in fact without them uh, reacting as they did and dealing with some of the logistical challenges we'd have had a lot more shortages and on the, on the supermarket shelves and in fact we did so that's um, the, the beginning of it um, what we're actually doing in terms of methods and approach uh, and again this is very much responding to the, the challenges of doing research in the new environment so we have an expert panel that's about 30 people they're fairly senior people, chief executives of, uh, of, um, of firms and uh, quite a few people involved in, in the sort of consortia around trade in, in the middle sector. We, we convene them once a month, although we talk to quite a few of them in between times as well. They've been brilliant actually in terms of guiding us. We're just about to launch a survey of food chain businesses, again these processors and distributors primarily uh, and we're doing a survey of farmers, which we we're actually were going to do anyway, and was postponed by uh, by the onset of COVID. We're, we're doing some telephone interviews with stakeholders, and we're monitoring the massive information that is coming forth on this. So that you know, there's media coverage all the time, which is hard to keep up with. There's academic literature, there's secondary data, a lot of data sets, a lot of a lot of the standard. Uh, sources of data, ONS type stuff, has been adapted to the new situation. So we've got a lot uh, to go on. We have no strong pre-established conceptual framing for this at all. It feels probably about the most empiricist bit of research I've, I've done. I'm not really a theoretician, but I normally have at least some sense of what the kind of theoretical framing is. This is really empirically driven stuff. Uh, our interest was what has happened and why but what happened literally what did people do what decisions were taken uh, you know how did how did you if you were running a flour mill and you suddenly had to be providing more small bags of flour instead of the large catering packs what did you actually do and how did you get around that 
what did the supermarkets do in terms of controlling some of some of the uh, the heightened consumption and demand etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're just trying to understand how the system adapts it and what we find is there's there's two completely and utterly contrasting narratives uh, if you go on on social media if you go into sort of various places one narrative is that this was incredibly successful that people managed to get their food the shelves although there were you know the odd shortage and the odd report of that on the whole it worked incredibly well and then there's another narrative saying this was a major crisis it exposed the frailties and, and the injustices of our food system well they can't both be right uh, i think there's elements of truth in both but we're sort of looking there for a, a, that sort of well you know who were the losers and who were the gainers in all this where it's also policy driven uh, what interventions were there uh, what interventions could there be what should there be there was even a call in the first few weeks of, of this for food rationing uh, by by some senior academics in this area that was followed up with some one minute to go that was followed up with some calls to the supermarkets to 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 make some very firm commitments around around justice in the food system etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're interested ultimately in sustainability social justice and health in all this but to begin with we're just trying to understand how the whole system works uh, which is quite a tall order actually okay i think i'm done fantastic thank you michael if you just unshare your screen Okay, that's 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 our that's our seven speakers. Thank you, everyone, so much, and for keeping to time so well. That was um, unexpected, actually. Um, just so we're going to, about to open up to general discussion, but just before we do, I thought I would just throw out a, 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 an open question at the panel, and just for anyone who wants to take it up. Um, and the question is this: So I think all of you have, have demonstrated so these are seven very convincing case studies in which um, I think if scholars have either um, taken expertise they developed um, in a different arena and have applied it to things that are happening during the pandemic or have taken projects that were designed in a slightly pre-pandemic but you know, adjacent kind of era um, and turned that project a little bit around toward to face some things that are, have become really salient in the pandemic. And I guess my question is, is, is that where we're at as an intellectual community? Is that, is that necessary work now? Um, or you know, how does that make us think about the general landscape of doing humanities and social science research you know, for the next few years? For anyone who would like to take it. Yeah, Catherine, please. I had, a, I had a very banal thought about this that, that does follow on. I think absolutely. I mean, I think we've all shown that if you dig deep into what you're already studying, because the thing is about this pandemic, it seeps into every aspect of our lives, every thought we have. Uh, um, and, 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 and in that sense, the humanities, the arts and the social sciences are perfectly placed to um, look into our, our own areas of expertise and to connect those um, to the pandemic. And I mean, the, the presentations to me just absolutely exemplified that. I mean, I was, yeah. Uh, Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, Angela, before I open it up, and just as Angela's speaking, if people want to raise their hands in the um, uh, participant pane, for, not for this issue or for any other issue they want to raise, um, now would be a good time to do it. But Angela, please. Um, again, very off the top of my head, but it's also striking me that, that various of these inquiries, it's as ever when you get a big change, you pay attention to things you didn't pay attention to before. And so, like Mike was saying about Actually, we don't know that much about food distribution. That's a bit silly. Um, and I suspect that's likely to be something that we all need to keep an eye out for, is that we'll, we'll just look at things that we didn't look at before um, and realize that there's, you know, whole under, underlying areas that aren't actually about COVID, but are more about wider society that, that we just forgot to look at before. Thanks. Okay, maybe at this point we'll, we'll open it up. So as, as Sabina said at the beginning, there's, there's two ways to participate. One is to just do the raise hand function in the participant pane, and the other is to throw a question into the chat box and uh, either Sabina or I will read it aloud. You can either ask a general question for the panel or for a specific member of the panel, or just an open reflection of your own is completely fine as well. So whoever would like to go first.
while people are thinking, um, actually, there's, uh, there yeah. is a question uh, from Judy Green directly to Luna in relation to her presentation, where she was asking whether uh, she thinks that shame is an interactive strategy may increase in times where social practices are changing rapidly. Luna, if you want to um, address this while we're waiting. Uh, yeah, thanks, Judy, for the question. I think that that is probably a fair assessment. I think shaming and um, social shaming or public shaming seems to increase when um, there's a concern with vulnerability. So I think in COVID, the idea is what we've seen is that you know people are afraid of of contracting the illness, and so shaming is a way to make sure that others don't transgress and to protect the self. But I think you're right that when um, social practices are changing rapidly. It's a way to um, shaming someone is a way to indicate that you are in line and that they are out of line. So you're within an in group and maybe others are in, within an out group. So perhaps the um, the combination of you know a, a potentially fatal illness circulating in a time where there are rapid needs to have behaviour change because of social distancing method, methods means it's just a very fertile ground for um, for, for social and public shaming. <clears throat> Fantastic, thanks Duda. So Brian Rapport is the next hand I see up and then Michael. Hi, Hi. Hello, oh, great. great. Um, so I had a question really about how to do, let's say, socially relevant research in these times. And, and I mean, I hear in, in all the presentations, you know, desire to, to contribute in some way, to, you know, to, to COVID as an ongoing phenomenon. Um, but that poses lots of challenges for, for us. I mean, it's a, it's a very fast moving topic. Um, it, is, uh, it is something that is engaging us collectively as whatever societies, which, which has um, maybe a lot of inroads into doing relevant research, but it also has a lot of challenges as well. Um, it's something that's, um, you know, kind of manifested itself at, at one time in a very uh, specific way, but is kind of re, you know, we can kind of whatever kind of see, see the next wave of it coming. So, so anyway, it's it, it's um, it, it's 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 a case where the question of how to how to intervene, how to be able to do research that's relevant, you know, co poses all sorts of uh, challenges and possibilities. Anyway, so I'm just wondering to hear from people like how are they, what are they planning to do with this research, and how how do they think they can kind of make it relevant? Uh, I mean, I hear that I heard that with the, the work on loneliness in terms of you know, create this kind of database of experiences and people can go in and reflect on it. But, but, but I'm wondering with the others, I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we try to, to do something in, in, in a situation that's so kind of rapidly changing and so particular? <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Luna, is that a, a gesture that you, you want to? Sorry, I know I just spoke, but I, just one of the really concrete things that we're doing with the Shame and Stigma project is, um, uh, well, the proposed project that we're waiting to hear about uh, if it's been funded, is to inform public health policy and public health interventions to think about how shame and stigma might be exacerbated or even just produced by the sorts of interventions that are um, being implemented. And I think the UK is a wonderful case study of how, you know, the, the incidences of shame and stigma haven't been thought through in how public health measures have been rolled out, where there has been a lot of public health measures, so social distancing and the various aspects of social distancing, like lockdown and shielding and stay-at-home orders and um, self-isolation, are breaking social bonds and, and causing people to have to be isolated from others, which is precisely the dynamic that happens in shame and stigma. And at the same time, those public health measures haven't, um, for the most part, reintroduced ways to keep social connection um, and people feeling that they're within communities. So there's definitely some really important um, public policy facing work that can come out of the work we're doing and that, that's the aim that will inform practice during this pandemic but also pretend, you know respiratory pandemics come in cycles so perhaps in a future pandemic scenario that that will also be relevant. Catherine I think you have your hand up there and just after you then it's going to be Michael I think and there's a question from Oslem in the chat and then it's Dora. So yeah Catherine please. Just, just very quickly, not to give you our sort of impact agenda for this uh, project, because it's funded by the SRC, so obviously there's an impact agenda. But one interesting thing we're doing with this is uh, we're working with an artist who is um, um, studying not only, she's not only going to represent in some way via film, via objects, 
uh, uh, and this connects to doing the actual research. So because we've got to do this stuff online, we're going to ask our research participants to give us objects that she can then use. We're capturing things on Instagram all the time uh, um, and in creating a film on using this media that we're all having to get used to uh, uh, um, um, and capturing our own conversations in doing the research. The idea is to have something really visual that we can then show the inequalities that we're finding in our in our actual research and and then take that to all sorts of different audiences be that schools be that policy makers i mean really reach people that if you like the pamphlet the uh, and this technology is helping us do that actually you know getting used to zoom uh, uh, uh using imagery uh, anyway it's creative it can be a creative space both for doing the actual field work and also for doing the impact and creating new partners with great ideas. Brilliant. Thanks, Catherine. I, Michael, I know you've had your hand up for a bit, but I just, Angelique, I think, wants to come in on this question too, just because it's a really important question. I want to bring her in before we move on, if that's okay. So, Angelique, over to you. You're on mute, sorry. Sorry, I attempted to unmute and then shifted screens completely. Right. Um, thanks very much uh, for the, the question. Um, I suppose um, a lot with what other people are doing, um, I'm trying to draw wider public attention to some of the issues that um, a lot of us are, are discovering um, and reach different audiences perhaps. So the book I mentioned earlier is a rewriting of the Life in the UK, Official uh, Citizen handbook um, and that's going to be really addressing um, just what the, the migrant and black British Asian communities have contributed to Britain um, for people you know anyone 12 onwards it ideally will be in schools um, and uh, maybe you know it's, it's, it's going to be in waterstones apparently um, so that that kind of intervention um, I suppose more public engagement because it feels like um, the sort of contribution that we can make on this is, is quite urgent. So, um, yeah. I'm also involved with, because of the work on COVID, I've become involved with the um, uh, Roma community. Um, as a lot of, that they've really been impacted by COVID, um, but it's also drawn my attention to other inequalities. For example, um, you know, huge uh, disparities in the way that they access uh, various resources uh, housing and education and higher education too. So there's something called the Roma Pledge uh, that I'll be talking to people at Extra about. I know Sheffield signed up to it. Just just offering mentoring and you know ways of of, of helping first generation Roma students uh, enter universities, um, and that's come out of this work. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Angelique. Michael, we're going to come to you, but I also want to pose to you, I know you have another point you make, but while you're there, let me pose the question that's directly to you in the chat. This is from Oslin Yilmaz. She, she asks, uh, thank you very much. My question is, in your farm save surveys, do you have questions directly concerning the well-being of farm workers and how their practice and well-being is affected by COVID? Michael. Okay, thanks. I'll come to that in a second. Now, let me do that first before I forget. Uh, we, we, we have a separate survey, it's not been led by me, it's been led by my colleague Matt Lobley on, on sort of the whole well-being and mental health of, of, I mean it's farmers rather than farm workers because there aren't that many farm workers as such, but it's a sort of small businesses. So that's happening at, at the moment. Um, so the answer is yes. I, wa I, I wanted to respond to Brian and I wanted to pose a question to Luna actually. Uh, Luna's work on shaming is fascinating and I, I wondered whether she was looking in any way at conspiracy theories in this area. Uh, I tell you an anecdotal story about a conspiracy theorist not far from where I live who went into the local supermarket and berated everybody for, fall, for falling for this whole COVID hoax and wearing their masks and socially distanced. He just, he just shouted at people stigmatizing them for actually believing that there really was an illness called COVID. So I guess it's a sort of added twist, the whole conspiracy theory area. I'm interested whether you're doing anything on that with regard to shaming. Uh, responding to Brian's interesting uh, point, um, yeah, Brian, you're, you're absolutely right that, that doing this stuff in a very fast moving terrain is really, really challenging. 
Uh, I mean, we took the decision early on that we were not going to just hang around and produce academic papers 18 months down the line. So we're producing a monthly bulletin online and we're also do, going to public put some working papers up online before they even go anywhere near a, a, a journal or a publisher. That's one way of trying to do, do it. Um, with regard to the relevance, well, I think the food system stuff is pretty relevant and, and DEFRA are involved in the expert panel and food standards agency. So they, they know what we're doing and are involved. Uh, and also the na there's a national food strategy being developed at the moment within DEFRA. Uh, and they've been quite involved in some public engagement. So I was on a panel, uh, I, was, I was talking to some good citizens of Grimsby earlier this week, uh, one evening when we had a public engagement panel for the National Food Strategy in Grimsby, Engage, you know, just engaging on issues of, of, of food and uh, where it comes from and the environmental impacts. So I think uh, it, it's possible to do this stuff in, in real time, but it, you're absolutely right to say that it's really, it is challenging us when things keep changing. <laughs> you know, it is, it is really tricky when, uh, when suddenly the rules change. And we've been talking about the hospitality sector disappearing and then coming back. Well, now, of course, it's disappearing again in certain parts of the country. So that, yeah, that makes, that makes us have to be very fleet of foot, to be honest. Thanks, Michael. Luna, do you want to come back on that very direct question before I, I go back to the... Yeah, to be honest, Michael, I haven't thought about conspiracy theories at all. And um, it's something in terms of the social elements of shaming we'll look into. Thank you. Thanks, Luna. Um, the next person is Dora Varga. And just as Dora's coming in, and um, there's a direct question for Ollie in the chat, which is someone has asked Ollie if you can put the um, URL for the lockdown blue, so you might pop that in there if you get a chance. Uh, Dora, please. Thank you. Um, I have a question to Angelique, unsurprisingly, as a historian. Um, I was wondering if it would make sense to, to, to situate and connect this um, eugenic history, uh, history of eugenics, which I'm very happy that you raised, to a broader <clears throat> historiography on human variation, and especially uh, in, uh, in post-war um, context of the rise of biomedicine. And uh, also connected to a longer history of, of bodies of color in medicine and, and how they're thought about in treatment and also the, uh, the way that they produce mistrust and trust among, um, was the mistrust, of course, um, in the, oh, I'm sorry, in, um, in, the, in the encounters and how that then, you know, feeds into this, uh, this whole thing. And the reason why I'm wondering about that is that what I see a lot happening is that these structural issues and the, 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 the structural racism issue is sort of pushed into the side in that very nuanced way of, of how race and, and, uh, and human variation is present in the medical encounters is uh, pushed aside and there is an increased focus on, okay, what is it genetically that makes people um, uh, uh, more prone to, to die in larger numbers in COVID and that you know, to, to sort of unpack the problematics uh, of that in a, in a more historical context, because of course that all has its own history. And that brings me, you know, to the question of, of, of then, you know, how can we understand these differences uh, in, in death numbers? You, you made a point that this is England we're talking about, and there is a clear eugenic policy at work, right? It's not even subtle, it's, it's quite uh, outspoken. Um, but then, you know, if we take all this other aspects of race and medicine into account, you know, what, how can we understand these regional differences or, or you know, what are the regional differences um, then? And I'm not, before I finish, um, you mentioned your work on the Roma um, uh, communities. And I, wanted, I was wondering if you were aware of the work that WHO Europe had done in Eastern Europe in, uh, in Roma communities uh, in increasing vaccine uptake and measles outbreaks uh, in Romania in particular, where they had um, quite successful interventions in, um, in engaging with, with the Roma community and, and sort of have kind of best practices. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dora. Um, yeah, some of some of the um, questions around vaccine take up um, and that that sort of uh, work did come up. It, there was a whole week uh, conference uh, last week. Um, it was the Roma National Inclusion Week. So sorry about that. And I was learning a huge amount. 
Um, in terms of variation, um, so I wasn't quite sure what the question was, but from a historical point of view, what I'd say um, uh, was it became a way uh, in the 19th century of countering eugenic ideas. So um, both, both Darwin and John Stuart Mill, writing from you know, the, the mid 19th century onwards, show uh, how variation can be used to um, challenge hereditarian notions by showing the impact of the environment, which of course takes away from heredit hereditary um, e explanations. Uh, but sorry, there were, there were some other questions there. Um, I wasn't quite sure uh, what the questions were, but for sure we're seeing, uh, and I think the, the current crisis has brought to the fore ways in which um, racism or, 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 or racist uh, methods or, 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 or racial disparities are uh, um, at the heart of, of medicine just by by the white body being taken as as the form that's usually used so so even you know in some of the the uh, medical textbooks etc using uh, working with people of color would yield very different results even in terms of um, you know diagnostics but I wasn't quite sure because uh, there was quite a lot there. What questions you're asking me? Uh, I think I've addressed some of them. No, normally, I would say, as chair, of course, you can pick this up over a glass of wine afterwards. But these very sad days, you'll just have to have an email exchange. <laughs> <laughs> you can drink wine while you email, I guess. We've we've a couple of questions queued up, and I'm keen to get them. There's a few in the chat as well. But George Newman has been waiting very patiently for a while. So, George, over to you. Um, hello. Uh, can you everyone hear me? Yes. Excellent. Right. Um, I think this is probably more aimed at Angelique and Luna, but um, anyone could chime in if they're interested. There's been a lot of mentions about how the outsize effects of COVID on traditionally vulnerable groups like um, black and minority ethnic, no social economic class, etc. This is obviously really bad and it's great that everyone is looking into it. But I was just wondering, is this, is this another example of hard times hit the most vulnerable hardest? Or is there something unique about COVID's effects that particularly make it worse, like distinguishing it from, say, recession of 08 or welfare cuts or anything like that. Uh, Thanks, George. Yeah, Angelique, please. Just, I would say, it throws into sharp relief what's already there. Um, and we see that through through the key workers um, and, and disproportionate effect on them as well. And a number of those are of colour. But you just see uh, class disparities and race and disabilities thrown into sharp relief by crisis like this, but they're there already. You know, the social injustices that the uh, attention is drawn to and are not brought into being by the yeah, so, so it's more of a, we've dialed up the problem that was already there rather than there being a particularly unique thing of the pandemic. Well, it throws them into sharp relief, but it exacerbates too. Thanks, Angelique. Does anyone else want to come in on that before I, I move on? And I, I was just going to say that I think, I mean, obviously there's the correlation between um, physical health and mortality rates and so on. But I think what we've seen with the way that, um, you know, policing strategies have been targeting ethnic minorities more for transgressions with following COVID restrictions, you know, so there's a, an entire social element of how these um, uneven distributions of powers and social inequalities are playing out in COVID. So it's not only exacerbating, um, obviously, on the, the health and you know, on the level of social and cultural um, determinants of health, but also in terms of how um, dynamics of racism, marginalization and discrimination play out in social political levels as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Luna. Thank, thanks, George, for that. Um, I have a couple. So I think Ginny wants to come in, and then Ollie, if you could both be very brief, because I've got three or four questions lined up, and then we'll, we'll move on. So Ginny, yeah, first. Yeah, I just wanted to agree with um, Luna um, and Angelique, but just to say that it seems like COVID is a double whammy, what, which maybe is why it's worse than other sorts of disasters that we've had, because people that are disadvantaged are doing worse, um, because because of the lockdown but also because of the infection so that because they're in more crowded situations for example they're more likely or their key workers they're more likely to contract covid but they're also more likely to suffer economically and socially um, because of lockdown measures so it seems like a double whammy to me 
Thanks, Jenny and Ollie. Yeah, as you said when you introduced me, the other project I'm working on is, is, is cancer and relationships. And the thing that I've been nurturing all morning in, in Invivo, the Invivo firm I'm working on, is the idea of, of, a, of COVID being a magnifying glass. And as this session's going on, it seems that that's certainly the case. And this magnifying glass is spreading across so many different areas of people's lives. And those cracks are already in the foundations and COVID is just magnifying in so many domains of everybody's existence. Thanks, Ollie. Um, so we have a question in the chat from Adrian Mercer. Um, Adrian asks, do any of the speakers have any thoughts about how notions of British or more specifically English, quote, exceptionalism have been important during the pandemic? I'm thinking about, for example, reluctance to have lockdowns because we are a, quote, freedom loving people. Any thoughts on that? Catherine, I wonder if that's more closest to you, yeah. I do, I mean, in that, um, uh, because in our research on Brexit, we've been looking at leavers and remainers worldviews, as it were, uh, um, and central to um, discourses, I mean, typically of, of both actually, of leave and remain, is this idea of nationhood and belonging to the nation and who is included and excluded in that. And we can see that, of course, in this COVID moment, uh, um, we very much had um, this, this idea of clapping for the NHS, you know, we'll meet again, the Second World War, uh, um, images of nationhood very much coming to the fore and creating this sense, uh, a sort of Second World War image of uh, um, Englishness and Britishness. And of course, part of the Leave discourse is evoking very much, if you think of the Leave campaign, uh, um, is evoking a very particular notion of Englishness and Britishness and who can belong to the, uh, uh, and ag again, evoking images of empire, uh, uh, you know, we had this idea of um, empire 2.0. So all these images of empire, of um, Britishness, of whiteness, of inclusion, of exclusion are being evoked in very public ways uh, um, in both Brexit and now uh, in COVID. And of course, the question becomes, how is that played out on the ground and who is included and excluded in those discourses? So sorry, it took me a bit to wind up to that. <laughs> Thanks, um, Catherine. Yeah, please, Angelique. Uh, I just wanted to um, add to that. I'd very much recommend uh, the, the writing of Fintan O'Toole. Um, he's a, a columnist with the Irish Times. He also writes uh, for The Guardian. He's written an excellent book on British exceptionalism and Brexit um, and um, heroic failure. Brexit and the politics of pain, and, and he's centrally concerned with exactly that question. Yeah, very, very psychoanalytic account of the, uh, the collective English psyche from Fintan O'Toole. Um, okay, um, there's a question from Stefano Canali in the chat that I want to hold for as a final question, if that's okay with Stefano, so we'll ask it in about five minutes. And in the meantime, maybe go to Maris, forgive my pronunciation, Marisa Marangoni, who I think has been waiting for a while. Uh, Marisa, please. I don't know if you can hear us. Yes, hi. Uh, hi. Hi, hello. Um, so um, I've been looking at, uh, well, unfortunately, shaming again, um, because um, the project I'm working on at the moment is about um, the relationship between global health policy frameworks and local health governance. Um, and it started in Italy, so I'm in Italy. It started in about 2017, when, um, when there was a lot of talk of new vaccinations and immunization policy was, a new immunization policy was introduced. And I started noticing that there was a lot of shaming going on, not only on the social media, uh, but actually coming from the government and institutions themselves, even from the medical institutions. Obviously, I'm talking about Italy, so I don't know whether in the UK it would be the same case. But So it would be interesting to see, um, well, to have a sort of comparative dimension between, well, because as Luna said, um, their research project is aimed at informing policy, but I believe probably policy in the UK, which would be different from policy in Italy, where it is the governments and the institutions themselves that are encouraging people to shame. 
Um, and also I've been looking at the wider moral dimension of medicine, um, which is actually quite, um, quite um, predominant as of late, uh, um, also regarding lifestyle. So we are becoming um, targeted in a way as being having to be responsible for our own health and increasingly of the health of others. And this is present, very much present now with the COVID situation, um, as it was with the childhood vaccinations uh, or as well with the influenza immunizations uh, campaigns and all that. So it's, a, it's actually a continuation. I don't detect a change of direction in that with this COVID situation, but actually there's a very clear continuation between this kind of moral shaming from the institutions towards the people. Um, and also, I think there's a, um, there's a um, link with uh, what uh, Angelique um, is uh, saying about the eugenics dimension, because um, there seems to be also an excuse coming up um, um, ever more frequently when it says, um, well, it's genetic, unfortunately, there's nothing to be done. So there seems to be, um, so two excuses on, on the one, on the one hand, so, it, Marisa, we're, just, we're running out of time just briefly, if you could, I think. Yeah, we're... sorry. Yeah. It, that was my final sentence. So on the one hand, it's personal. So we, we are responsible for our own health and for the health of others rather than the general environment or medicine, whatever. And also when something bad happens, then it's genetic. So there's not much of an, ex of a, of a, of an excuse to, to look deeper into the issues, socially and medically. Fantastic, thank you. And I think it's so briefly, if you could please, links to Luna and then to Angelique. And then I want to come back to Stefano's question as a kind of a, a closing device for us. Um, just, I, I mean, I completely agree with you that shaming is definitely a strategy um, in the U well, in the UK, I think it's more implicit than explicit. I mean, you just think about the anti-obesity campaign that was um, launched in August by the Prime Minister, which is essentially a campaign about fat shaming and how people need to take responsibility for their um, their weight, and that's directly related to um, you know whether or not they're going to come down with COVID. Um, and so I think that the, you know the the pernicious um, ideas of personal responsibility. Um, are, 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 obviously directly correlated to ideas about shaming and moral shaming. Mm -hmm. Thanks Luna. Angelique, did you want to come in briefly on that? You're muted. Sorry, I actually muted you. It's my fault. Remind me of the question. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe we'll, if we take it up in the chat, maybe Marissa can post it in the chat and you can take it up there. She's got about three questions to go in five minutes. So I'll, if, we, if we leave it in the chat, if that's okay. Um, Stefano is question has been hanging around there for a while and I want to ask it um, from any of the panel. I'm actually gonna, maybe going to put uh, Angela Cassidy on the spot a bit if she doesn't mind. The question is, it's following up on Brian's question and Luna's, answers on, uh, Luna's answer on relevance, which is, do you think that the social sciences and humanities community could do more to play a more central role in policy making for public health emergencies? I want to come first to Angela, but anyone else who would like to take, which is a kind of a quite a broad question, I think that anyone might want to come back to. Angela, please. Oh, that's a doozy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm quite interested in, in the way you say could do more um, because uh, we can, th the, the relationship between kind of uh, policy and, and expertise, there's always an interaction. So on the one hand, I think you could broadly say that, that in social sciences and humanities, we're not necessarily up until the impact agenda starts to kick in, um, there's less of a kind of a habit of, of trying to, to reach out in that way. But on the other hand, the um, uh, reaching into to policy is not necessarily so easy to do either. But there, there's certainly lots that we can say and do, something that has just popped into my head. We're all talking about the individualization of shame and risk and so on and so forth. And, uh, that we have that at the same time as we have a government that's obviously at the very least very conflicted about the idea of intervening um, around uh, COVID. And so there's lots and lots of work around the individualization of risk and how that can be used as a distraction away from 
of the role of government that just immediately springs to mind. So we've got lots to say, but finding the right ways to say it is probably the best way. And I'm going to ask Michael to kind of talk a bit about that because that's very much his home territory. Well, well, well passed, you. Michael. Every, with the Thank you for that, Angela. I was listening carefully to what you said, but hadn't anticipated the final sentence. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's a tricky one, though, isn't it? Because uh, I, policy is very fragmented. Uh, and Angela said that because I'm very involved in, in, in DEFRA kind of policy circles and nature conservation and food and those sort of things not in public health emergencies, although of course, as I've already indicated, food is an aspect of that. I mean, my simple answer is yes to, to, to Stefano. You, you know, it, it's all about social science and humanities, really. I mean, you know, we can't frame these issues in, in any other way most of the time. Um, so, and I think increasingly within, within the government circles I move, that, that is recognised uh, that, you know, the. These issues are, you know, whether you're talking about, about the land and, and, and climate change or it, it's all about people's behaviour and people's willingness to, to change their behaviour and, and how to intervene in those, in those ways. So you can't, you can't just do it by, by, by some sort of engineering or natural science intervention. So, yeah, I think, I think the answer is, is absolutely yes. But the how to do it is, 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 is really challenging, I know. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I've spent I've spent a whole career sort of doing this sort of stuff, and I still don't think I've got very far. And I scrape the surface a lot of the time, to be honest. And it, you know, personnel change, policy initiatives change. Uh, you know, you find someone you knew really well in a particular position in a, in a government department suddenly shifted, and you've got to start a whole relationship again or a new network and new. So it's 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 really difficult for those social reasons, really. Thanks, Michael. I was, I was hoping for a more affirmative closing note, but we're on time, and that's the closing note we have, but it's, it's a nice one nonetheless. Um, we're just up on time, I think. I think so, Sabine and I, I guess we should probably just thank the speakers um, for, for, for participating in this quite um, not always easy um, mode, of, mode of interaction. I want to thank all the participants for, for a lively discussion. We need to thank Chi Wong and Lucy Hodges, who are doing a lot to hold together the infrastructure that is making these events possible. Um, and if I've forgotten anything, Sabine, or is that... I think that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's good. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Well, this, is, this is hopefully the first of, of further events. Yeah. 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 I just thank just to remind good. everybody that I've put in the chat. I mean, first of all, there's a few more comments that I think people may be interested in reading. Yes. And also, I've put the link to uh, the platform that we put together over the summer, which we continue to display the work that we are doing uh, in Exeter, coming from many different directions and disciplines on these kinds of topics. So you can catch up with some of that um, as it happens. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Nice to see you.